think you might have to verify that's okay. All right, I'll hand it over to you. Well, thank you so much. It is a pleasure and privilege to meet with you and talk about the city that I love. Now, you have to understand I came from Finland and I was just thinking today that it was 52 years ago. So that uh, tells, it tells all of us that I am a relic. And in fact, it is, it is very interesting to think about how different today's Baltimore looks from the Baltimore that I first encountered in 1969, one year after the riots. Uh, that Baltimore was a Baltimore before the Harbor Place, which then became a very successful tourist attraction. It was estimated that, that some years up to 20 million people came there. Now, how they came up with that figure, who knows? But I mean, it was a huge success and we all know what's happening at Harbor Place today and what's happening in the surrounding area. So, so when I'm talking about Baltimore, various uh, uh, dimensions of Baltimore, I have to make sure that you understand that I am talking about the pre-COVID Baltimore. We have no idea of where we are going from this point on. Baltimore is a very reliant on both state and federal aid. And so in today's situation, we don't even know who the president is going to be, whether there is going to be any urban policy and whether it is going to be a uh, punity policy or, or something that would encourage further development of the cities. Um, Baltimore, when I came here in 1969, uh, I, I regarded myself as a foreign correspondent. Everything was new to me. I came from Finland. I was working in a foreign language in a strange city. And I, I got around the city, uh, particularly because my first assignment was to cover cops and chase ambulances and fire engines. And so there was hardly a corner of the city that I did not visit day or night. In, in those days, my racial attitudes were pretty much uh, informed by naivete, a belief that, that recently passed laws would have made an instant difference in the city. That was not true at all. Baltimore in those days was a, a very uh, extensively segregated city as it continues to be in many, many facets today. Uh, I had... Uh, Well, in, in today's Baltimore, we are talking about two cities, really. We are talking, you know, the, the traditional division line in the city has been into West Baltimore and East Baltimore. There has always been some more um, class attached to West Baltimore, uh, particularly in the black community, mostly because with the exception of Morgan State University, all the major black institutions have traditionally been on the West side, NAACP, uh, Urban League, the Afro newspaper, and so on. And, and today's uh, West Baltimore, interestingly enough, is anchored by the University of Maryland medical facilities and VA, anchor, uh, VA hospital and, and the various research institutions. On the other side of the city, of course, the big uh, factor is the Johns Hopkins uh, University and Hospital. There are two medical campuses that Hopkins operates on the uh, east side. And so, so uh, these, these are the, uh, the kinds of uh, divisions that we see. Now, th those, uh, those, those institutions also underscore another point, And that point is that, that uh, they are islands of first world excellence in a city which otherwise exhibits many uh, symptoms of third world uh, pathologies and, and dysfunctions. And, and this is, this is a, a problem with which Baltimore uh, has been trying to grapple for lots of years. And, and uh, the, the report card is kind of uh, still incomplete. The 1968 riots were a low point in the city's history, uh, recent history. There had been several decades of white flight that had changed the city's complexion, even though there had been a steady influx of African Americans from the Carolinas, so that the city's population until the 1980s did not show any drastic drop. 
and housing also was being recycled whites leaving incoming uh, African Americans taking over those neighborhoods. Now let me then talk a little bit about the history and I hope that you have some tolerance because this is going to be complicated and some of it may be uh, maybe something that you have already familiarized yourself with, but at the same time, it is essential for understanding Baltimore. Morgan State University professor Lawrence Brown talks about Baltimore as consisting of a white L and a black butterfly. The white L on his maps is where the city spends most of its infrastructure money, where prestige neighborhoods like Guilford, Roland Park, and Homeland are located and gentrification advances along the inner harbor shoreline. Overall, according to the planning department, as late as five years ago, white areas got twice as much public investment money as the black ones. That's not all. In the black butterfly, mortgages and investment capital are difficult to obtain. The list goes on. Most public housing and section eight tenants live in the black butterfly where residents have to resort to check cashing places instead of banks, where the worst schools are located and where access is limited to quality foods at affordable prices. How did we get here? It's a long story, but necessary to know if we want to understand today's Baltimore. A, big, a bit of big picture context. In the Civil War, Maryland was a slaveholding state but it did not bow to the Confederate ranks, even though by culture and tradition, many residents felt affinity for the South, particularly Virginia. In fact, Baltimore 100 years ago was, was seen as, as the commercial and industrial capital of the Upper South. After Reconstruction ended in 1877, racial and religious polarization increased. The turning point came 22 years later when Democrats regained political control in Baltimore. They had sympathized with the Confederacy. Now in 1899, they declared, this is a white man's city. Subsequent steps were taken to introduce unforgiving segregation in various aspects of life. Big department stores did not cater to black shoppers unless they were making purchases for their white employers. Theaters and restaurants did not serve blacks, nor hotels. Even music became segregated. A colored park band lasted until the mid 1960s. For several years also, there was a colored symphony orchestra and choir because blacks were not admitted to the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra concerts. In fact, that colored symphony orchestra was founded uh, thanks to a donation from a white patron who attached two conditions to his or her uh, bequest and that those conditions were that the donor's name be kept secret and also that the donor not be required to attend any, con uh, any concerts. Baltimore in this process became as segregated as almost any town in Dixie with one exception, public transit never was segregated here. Beginning in 1907, Democrats even tried to take voting rights away from blacks, but were three times defeated by the statewide electorate. Then came 1910. 1910 was a red letter year. First that year, Roland Park legally prohibited blacks from residing there except for living domestic servants. A few months later that same year, Baltimore became the nation's first city to require that all residential lots be segregated. Under that 1910 law, people could move only to streets where their race was in the majority. Those who violated the law could be criminally prosecuted. Some 30 other cities followed Baltimore's lead and enacted segregation laws. Three years later in 1913, the Roland Park Company ended any further sales to the Jews. Roland Park had been created in the 1880s and was a pioneering garden suburb which influenced other plant districts throughout the nation. 
Half a dozen prominent Jews lived in Roland Park in those days. Among them was the celebrated portrait photographer David Backrack, who took the only picture we have of Abraham Lincoln at Gettysburg. There was also the Levy family, who were the world's biggest manufacturers of straw hats. Baltimore was a very important center of garment manufacturing, including hats and umbrellas. Now, in 1913, they were told that when they moved, they no longer could sell to other Jews. Instead, the Roland Park Company handled the sales, screening the prospects. It wanted its development to be known as the most exclusive in the city. Quote, the neighborhood has to decide whether it wants to be Jewish or Gentile, it cannot be both, unquote, declared the company president. Baltimore became a laboratory of bigotry. It was as restri restrictive covenants like Roland Parks became widespread, Baltimore's real estate and lending industries adopted the exclusion of blacks and Jews, but in some cases also Italians and other European ethnicities. Even in neighborhoods that did not have covenants, the real estate board decreed that no houses should be sold or rented to inharmonious elements. And another, and another measure of how, how widespread this was, until the 1960s, all real estate ads in the Baltimore Sun were segregated. Houses white, houses colored. Then there was a category respected. Everyone knew what it meant. No blacks, no Jews. I remember that in the early 1970s, two com competing multiple lists existed in Baltimore. The Board of Realtors owned and operated the main list. A separate list uh, listed homes in suburbs that were open to the Jews. So instead of a dual housing market, which, is common to, which was common to many, more, many other American cities, uh, Baltimore had a triple market, a different market for whites, blacks, and, and Jews. So far, I have talked about the city's actions and private sector policies, but it was the federal government that took the lead role in fostering residential segregation and neighborhood inequities. This happened through redlining, which produced the American cities we know today. Redlining still affects us. Just think of this. In 2015, only four supermarkets in the city, out of a total of 43, were situated in areas that the redlining maps branded as the riskiest categories, red and yellow. Redlining came about in the middle of the Great Depression in the mid 1930s, when a predecessor of the Federal Housing Administration divided neighborhoods in 239 cities according to perceived real estate risks. In each city, a task force was given a regular street map and crayons and told to paint the town. Four colors were used, green, blue, yellow, and red. Each city was divided into neighborhoods that the government felt either deserved capital and neighborhoods that it felt did not. According to the map makers, WASP values, homogeneity, and bigotry had to be the guiding principles. Any mixing of races, ethnicities, religions, and social classes was bad. Neighborhoods, they declared, rotated in, on, in one direction only, downward. Federal banking and housing authorities thus promoted lending not only in the most viable neighborhood. Declining areas were redlined and deprived of desperately needed renovation money. Today we argue about gentrification. That term was not in use in those days and anyway, the redlining maps outlaw gentrification or giving money to neighborhoods on the skates. On the redliners maps, the best color category was green. It marked upscale neighborhoods of modern housing that barred blacks and Jews, had an American born majority, usually of Protestant faith and of Anglo-Saxon, Scandinavian or German bloodlines. Think of Guilford and Homeland. The federal government regarded such neighborhoods as safe for lending. The color blue denoted somewhat more modest neighborhoods. Residents there 
were usually lower on the real estate industry's ladder of preferred ethnicities and included the Irish, Americanized Czechs, Poles, and Lithuanians. They lived in houses that were relatively new with bathrooms and indoor toilets. Think of Hamilton and Lakeside Edna Gardens. Those neighborhoods too were seen as safe for lending. Quote, they are like 1935 automobile, still good, but not what the people are buying today who can afford a new one, the mapmakers explained in 1937. Interestingly enough, when Guilford, Homeland, and, and original Northwood was, were, were given the uh, highest rating as neighborhoods. Roland Park was not because the federal government felt that the houses in Roland Park, which by that time were 40 years old or, or, or in, in that, that range, that they were too, too old to be desirable in, in the future market. So, so this, is, this is how uh, those kinds of decisions were made and, and the impact they had. Today, of course, Roland Park is one of the more desirable neighborhoods in the city. By, two, by contrast, two other categories were labeled as risky or dangerous, as the uh, federal government said. Yellow marked transitional neighborhoods that were characterized by age, obsolescence, and change of style, expiring restrictions or lack of them, infiltration of lower grade population, and that's uh, verbatim from a federal document, the presence of influences with increased sales resistance, such as inadequate transportation, insufficient utilities, uh, poor maintenance of homes, and et cetera. And, and so what the federal government was saying was that these areas could be, um, loans could be made in these areas, but these loans would have to be made on a totally different basis as that extended to the Roland Parks and Hamiltons of, of Baltimore. And so, so the same thing uh, then uh, also uh, applied to neighborhoods that, that uh, were colored red. And, and basically what the federal government said in those days was that influences and phenomena that were experienced in, in uh, the yellow areas, the transitional areas, that those influences already had completed their work in areas uh, that were, were colored red. And so uh, in, in Baltimore, all of the aging housing in Baltimore's urban core all neighborhoods between Fulton Avenue on the west side and Highland Town, they were colored red. As to today's redevelopment hotspots, the Inner Harbor, Fells Point, and Canton, they were not on these maps because they were described as industrial and not conducive for residential living. Lenders were told to avoid the yellow colored transitional neighborhoods which did not have restrictive covenants to stop blacks, Jews, or Italians from moving in. Their inevitable fate was to be redlined, said the federal government. If any lending occurred at all in the yellow and red areas, the government recommended that it be done at higher interest rates and stricter overall terms. Thus, in the mid-1930s, the federal government sanctioned a two-tier real estate lending system one set of rates and terms for the preferred customers in areas that excluded minorities and another set of requirements elsewhere. This is how today's subprime lending practice was born. In the absence of new investment, decline and deterioration became self-fulfilling prophecies. A recent study shows that three out of four neighborhoods redlined on government maps 80 years ago continue to struggle economically. Redlining deprived much of the center city of improvement capital. It did not matter whether those neighborhoods were white or black. Among areas redlined were Bolton Hill, Reservoir Hill, Mount Vernon, and Charles Village. Also redlined were such blue color areas as Hamden, Remington, and South Baltimore near Federal Hill. The absence of loan money hastened declined. Only two black neighborhoods escaped redlining. 
Morgan Park near the university and Wilson Park between the Alameda and York Road. Those were neighborhoods of black professionals. Morgan Park splendidly satisfied the redliners' prejudices. It was, a, it was a new development and still being built. Its residents were restricted to educated blacks. W.E.B. Du Bois lived there between, the, between 1939 and 1950, and its governance prohibited inharmonious elements by banning whites. The 1930s redlining maps are supremely important because they st steered neighborhood investment and development after World War II. Up to that point, even good customers could often only get mortgage loans for up to seven years. When such loans matured, the balloon had to be paid off and the loan refinanced, which always was full of risks. And so, so uh, an easy, relatively easy, refinancing was possible only in areas colored green and blue. Now, after redlining, the federal government gradually introduced mortgage insurance. Long-term mortgages for up to 30 years also were offered, but they were initially available only to whites moving to newly constructed suburban housing. By contrast, the suburbs were close to blacks. If African Americans wished to improve their housing conditions, they had to buy from white families abandoning homes in neighborhoods when blacks approached or moved in. But since conventional lenders did not make loans in redlined areas, blacks had to deal with middlemen, speculators nicknamed blockbusters. Blockbusters fanned racial fears so that fleeing whites would sell their houses below market value. Blockbuster would call at all hours of day and night, hoping to get a listing. Did you hear about the rape, somebody would ask, regardless of whether there had been a rape or not. Once they got a listing, Blockbusters would then flip those houses, reselling them to black buyers at double or triple the acquisition price. They could do this because they were the only game in town. That they provided financing. There is a big office building near the courthouse on Lexington Street that was famous for having all kinds of offices headed by lawyers that, that uh, accommodated syndicates or private investors who were uh, investing in racial change. Few blacks or whites believed that racially diverse neighborhoods were possible. The tipping point was so low that the neighborhood's racial fate was sealed when it became 5% black. Until the 1960s, after, until the riots, 80% of black home buyers entered into rent to buy contract instead of straight sales. Those were not recorded, no deed changed hands, and there was no settlement. No appraisal was con conducted either. This, this led into all kinds of problems and, and uh, because there also was no foreclosure pro process in case somebody did not make the payments. If a contract buyer failed to make those payments on time, the seller could simply evict the deadbeat and offer the property to the next family, perhaps at a higher price. Many blacks were completely naive about buying a house and could be persuaded to sign anything. A typewritten clause added to a 1963 land installment contract by Morris Goldsucker, one of the big uh, names in town, shows the potential for abuse. At a time of tightening city codes that required expensive modernization, its sweeping language stipulated, and I quote, it is understood and agreed that the sellers shall have the right at any time during the life of the contract to do any repairs or improvements now or hereafter required by law and at the cost of such repairs and improvements to the purchase price stated in this contract. Among other hazards of black home buying were ground rents, a concept going back to the colonial times and based on the British practice of renewable 99-year leases. In brief, in hopes of cutting acquisition costs, the family bought only the house and leased the land. The ground rent 
payable twice a year usually was so modest that many neglected to pay it. They came to regret that oversight. If they skipped even one ground rent payment, the owner of the land could foreclose on them. That added such a lucrative wrinkle to the shady rent to buy practice that many speculators instituted a ground rent even on houses which did not have one. Hundreds of contract buyers lost the houses, some with improvements they had paid for, new roof, new furnace, club basement. Hundreds of others did manage to ultimately acquire the house free and clear. Many were so traumatized that they stayed in those houses for much of their later life, not wanting to go through the experience again. This is how today's Bolton was created through bigotry that was endorsed by the local and federal governments and embraced by the real estate industry. And I stop here and open the floor for any possible questions. Thank you.